it, it's interesting because things like that that are so innocent, like a young man going to see a popular movie, yeah. they become the biggest issue for, for no real reason. And they become such a big issue because someone else is snitching. You know, yeah. they're, they're concerned about what someone else is doing. Yeah. And, and it, it, it fosters this culture of snitching, but it also a, a culture of distrust. Yes, because these brothers and sisters that you're supposed to love and depend on and feel that you could talk to them about anything, you really can't talk to them about everything because if you say one thing that is off script, they're going to go to the elders about you. Preach, <laughs> preach, man. And you're right; it does create. That's something I I struggled with for many years is trust, trusting people because it skews your view. That's just one of so many layers, so many things that really skews your view into the world. Now, um, I'm going to move along from that. And I want to talk about something that I've heard you talk about heavy before, something that I just realized over the last year or two, and that is racism in their publications and the Bible. And I'm saying this because I was talking to my younger brother a couple of years ago, and he, he was, I'm here I am thinking I know all this stuff. And he mentioned that to me and I thought, what are you talking about? And from there, I went on to see exactly what he was talking about. Can you talk to me about how you came to, to see that and, and your thoughts on how you feel about it? Yeah, so initially my feelings on race within the Jehovah's Witnesses were just informed by my personal experiences. Um, I'm from New York City, which is, you know, known as like the most diverse place on earth. But obviously there are plenty pockets of racism. Um, and I grew up in a predominantly black congregation. So there were times where we were exposed to, you know, white Jehovah's Witnesses. But for the most part, we were around uh, mostly black Jehovah's Witnesses. But there were instances like at larger assemblies and conventions where you heard certain comments um, that were definitely racially charged, um, some that were just straight up racist. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it really, it bothers you because you're taught from a young age that, you know, this is the truth. This is God's one true organization. And yeah, some people are imperfect, but everyone here loves each other, right? So in your mind, there's no space for racism. You know, little did I know that there was plenty of racism going on. And, and that's just at like a, a personal level, like, you know, situations where people were called racial slurs or when they didn't want a certain brother to be appointed as an elder because of their race. That's just at, you know, a personal level. It wasn't until I had woken up from the Jehovah's Witness doctrine and I started doing research that I realized that it went far deeper than that, that it's actually at a organizational level. Um, when you go back and look at some watchtowers and, and uh, back then, you know, they had the, the Golden Age was one of the uh, publications. And you see some of the racist, straight up racist comments made. They're borderline laughable because yeah. you're like whoa 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 what in what world would a rational person think to say this you know especially in god's one true organization right yeah yeah can i um i want to put a pause on that i want to read something it was a post that you put up okay and you just mentioned the golden age the golden age is a publication from many years back in this religion and the date you have on this is July 24th, 1929, page 702. And there's a question and answer form, and I, and I want to read this for my listeners. The question is, is there anything in the Bible that reveals the origin of the Negro? Okay. Answer, it is generally believed that the curse, the curse which Noah pronounced upon Canaan was the origin of the Black race. And further along in that, it talks about serving, um, being servants of other humans. But the very last sentence says this about Black people. There is no servant in the world as good as a good colored servant. And the joy that he gets from rendering faithful services is one of the purest joys there is in the world. End quote. 
listeners, that is a quote from one of their publications. Talk to me about it, bro. Oh, man. That, that one, I, when I saw that one, I, I had to laugh because it is, it's so demonstrably racist. Like, yeah. it is ridiculously racist to, to not only say that it's a curse to be Black, but to say that these are the people that just, they just love being servants. You know, yeah. they just love, you know, waiting on, on us good white people to, yeah. to help us. Like, <laughs> I mean, in what world do you see that and not think that you are a scumbag? Yeah, yeah. just the open and blatant disrespect. And I, like you, I grew up, it was an all black congregation, right? So I didn't, and let me be honest, most of the time, every day that I was there, my body was, but my head was outside of the wall. So I, I, we may have read it and I just missed it, but it wasn't until, you know, I'm 43 years old that I actually started to see some of this stuff. And it was just amazing. All the, again, all the layers of control and demeaning of people. And I know you also made a video about that, right? Can you, can you cover on some of those points? Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I made a video on YouTube and it's called Black people should not be Jehovah's Witnesses. Right. And I, <laughs> I gave it that title purposely because I wanted it. I wanted it to catch people's attention. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually planning on doing a part two to that video. Okay. But the, um, the, the points that that I brought it brought out in that video was first of all the racist statements that had been made in the past, like that one you just read. Um, but also the organizational structure of Jehovah's Witnesses. When you do the research and history on Jehovah's Witnesses, there have been over 30 governing body members uh, in the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the governing body uh, arrangement came about in the 1970s. But every single governing body member, except for Samuel Hurd, has been a white person. Now, it doesn't make sense if you know, you're to consider what Jehovah's Witnesses believe about race. They believe that God is not partial and God loves everyone regardless of race or nationality. So if that is the case, why would God only select with his Holy Spirit white men and one black guy to lead the organization? There's not one uh, uh, Asian, there's not one Native American, you know, there's not even anyone who's of Latin descent. They're all white guys, you know, mostly American white guys, except for Samuel Hurd. Yeah. So let me condense that for everybody. Jehovah's Witnesses have been around for 150 years or so, and they've had 30, <laughs> 30 Black people at the helm. Let that sink in. Um, yeah, man, you got a lot of a lot of stuff out, and and I hope you guys. I'm gonna put as much as I can in the link below, and we'll talk about the rest of it at the end of it. But you guys need to go check this stuff out because is is it 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 is very very informative. Now let's talk about some of their predictions. All right, 1975, year I was born. You know, I heard 1941. All these years, why? Are Jehovah's Witnesses, even if you don't believe in the Bible, why are people having a hard time understanding that the Bible says, hey, nobody knows, not even Jesus, but the governing body knows every few years? That is such an interesting concept to me because, I mean, if there is any way to get exposed, it's making predictions. You know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big sports fan, for example. You know, I, I, I love basketball, baseball, football. And one of the things that I, you know, I tend to do, like, I like to gamble on games, but in a sense, you're, you're making a prediction. You're, you're, you know, you're putting your money where your mouth is. You know, if I think, you know, the Lakers are going to beat the Raptors, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to put some money on that. And if I lose, I have to pay the price by losing my money. So if you, as, you know, a, a writer for a Jehovah's Witness publication, you know, have the nerve to say that, hey, you know, there's only so many years left to 1975. You're making a prediction. And if it doesn't come true, you're going to lose something there. 
And it, I, I just don't understand for the life of me why they would make those predictions. It doesn't make sense. And for those people who, you know, have done the research, they know that after 1975, the organization took a big dip in numbers because people were like, hey, we were waiting for something special. Nothing special happened. Yeah. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, That that is, you know, amazing to me that it no matter what and it's not like they don't know i used to think that people weren't aware that what they believed was nonsense right people know actually at the end of the day one day i was um actually out with a dude he was you know he's a dude of the street right and we we're having lunch and we we're in the basketball league and i was explaining to him about my background as a jehovah's witness and he told me we know gang banging is stupid but you know, and he continued on. And I didn't hear anything else after that because that was when I realized, the point I'm making is that was the point I realized people know that their belief systems are no good for them. You know, they're absolutely no good. I just can't figure out or how best to to, to break the majority of them away from it. And so having said that, what do you think, what do you think we are, we as ex Jehovah's Witnesses, where are we in the process of, of breaking people away? You know, I, I have a strong belief that no one wakes anyone else up. People wake themselves up. I think it, you just have to be ready to start asking the questions. Um, because for me personally, you know, like many Jehovah's Witnesses, I had come to be afraid of the A word, apostate, right? Mm -hmm. So I had never interacted with what was considered apostate information I never talked to anyone who was considered an apostate, but I started questioning things within myself, you know, just looking at the doctrine. And I never read or watched a single piece of apostate anything until I had woken up on my own. Sure. And, and it's funny because Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they always warn people, you know, don't listen to these apostates because the fear is that they're going to be woken up to something. I never listened to the apostates and I just had to put it on my own. Yeah. And, and personally speaking, you know, I know witnesses who are still in who refuse to listen to apostates. It doesn't matter. They've heard what apostates said and it doesn't, it, it has no effect on them because they're not ready to listen. Yeah. They're not ready to question things. Yeah. So I think we play an important role as XJW's because we're there when people are ready to ask questions. I think if we try to force people, if we try to push them, they're not going to want to hear it. But if we're still there when they're ready to ask those questions, then that's when we can be effective. Absolutely. They make the word apostate such a, a horrible word. And if you take the time, current Jehovah's Witnesses who are listening, if you take the time to look that word up, it simply means I changed what I believe. You know what I mean? Change your religious belief, whatever it is. But the point is, there is nobody on the planet that should be thinking the same way at 25 as 45. We are all apostates to some degree, you know? And um, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, and I hear what you're saying and I, and I believe what you're saying, but I hope sometimes our words give people a, a jolt and a spark to say, hey, you know, maybe I need to reconsider this. So um, I can't remember when we started, but I do have one last question for you. Um, where are you now as an ex Jehovah's Witness, as a family man, as a black man, in your thoughts, where are you now after having experienced all of that? You know, I was someone who, um, I, I liked the Jehovah's Witnesses when I was a part of it because I believed that they were like the logical Christians, right? I had grown up around people who had belonged to different churches, like, you know, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, and I viewed them as like emotional Christians, you know, they, they enjoyed the music and they enjoyed, you know, catching the Holy Ghost and things of that sort. But I liked being a Jehovah's Witness because I felt like it was more of an academic environment, you know, like we answered questions and we, we gave talks and we studied, right? And in a sense, I kind of apply that same thing uh, to my life now. I, I look for the logic, right? And eventually that's what woke me up uh, from being a Jehovah's Witness and from being a Christian in general. I applied logic to 
not only 